Thank you so much. Hey, I, I appreciate you guys showing me the uh, the work in progress with the uh, Michael's uh, virtual space. Good, good work on that, Michael. Um, I've been really interested in that sort of thing, and I've been wanting to check out Monoly too. I, I only recently got on my radar, so it was kind of cool to see that. Um, so I just prepared this this talk. I've never given it before, and um, it's it's a subject that's very interesting to me. And I also think it's very ripe for lots and lots of research. I think, and so that was part of my motivation. A, share something I'm interested in so I can be passionate talking about it. And B, expose everyone to a few ideas. Some, some may be old ideas to you, some may be brand new, so, but hopefully it'll spark some enthusiasm for different areas of research. Um, and I think one of the, biggest areas of research is um, swimming like a fish. And I'm really sorry that I missed uh, seeing you, Alicia, trying to pretend to be a fish. That would have that would have been the best thing ever. Um, all right, oops. All right, who the heck am I? How am I from the future? Well, I'm more ancient than I care to admit, but I'll tell you, I started programming in 1979. I, I taught myself. It was there was one computer back then that was accessible to Radio Shack TRS-80 Model One. They had a fantastic manual with a little cartoon computer that taught you how to program, and that was and I was highly motivated. I lived in the middle of nowhere on a dairy farm, and so it was just me and that that book. Um, and I knew then I wanted to be a, a, a video game programmer, and but I went to college. I got a degree in economics, which was worthless for me, <laughs> more or less. But the other half of my double major was computer science, so very helpful. Uh, eventually, worked my way to Dallas, uh, became a programmer for Paradigm, uh, became a tech lead, I specialized in AI programming. So this was in the in the late 90s, all this started. And we were doing 3D, we did it back on Nintendo 64, all the way up to Xbox 360. Um, so I got a lot of experience with with virtual worlds and physics and artificial intelligence. And so that dovetailed nicely into what we're doing now. When I started from the future, initially we were doing games and then we realized the just absolute potential impact we could have taking that technology and applying it to virtual reality. And more specifically the last few years, you know, applying that to education training and that has excited me. I always thought, hey, I will do video games, but I realized this is where um, my life has more meaning and more impact, you know, while making a living. So it's perfect. Um, and then, you know, I had a little more time over the summer, thanks to, you know, a little, little thing called the pandemic. And so I spent my mornings working on a book, which Alicia mentioned too, but I do want to, uh, you know, if you want to get on Amazon or link to uh find the link on our uh web page for from the future you can you can get a copy uh if you if you want to uh, submit your email you can get a free copy if you want to just go to amazon and find it you can pay 99 cents and so it's it's an ebook it's not a novel it's, you know, it's about eleven thousand words uh but it covers uh some of what we're talking today um but it, it gives you an insight into what you know a developer such as myself that's heavily involved in VR, what we're thinking these days, especially when it comes to education and training. So why beyond realism? Well, uh, I've been at this for a few years, and so I've, I'm looking back, I realized the first instincts of somebody that's first getting into VR is to absolutely replicate reality. You know, the belief is, hey, it's got to be as real as impossible to be as immersive as possible. Well, I found out that's not true. Um, you really just need to focus on key portions. And then, you know, when you look at the limitations of just replicating reality, you realize you can go way beyond what's real to uh, have a larger impact on teaching and training. And in some cases, VR exceeds reality and learning. So like if you're doing it in a learning to do situation, learning to operate equipment, you can go well beyond reality. And I'll point out some of those, some of the reasons why as we go, get, go through. Um, you can have, uh, and you probably, you might've heard this before if you've been to any talks, especially from Oculus, they talk about giving, giving users superpowers. 
So we'll talk about the different superpowers you can have that are beyond reality that you can give users and trainers or educators. Um, and the thing I'm most excited about, uh, and I think is the area that's super ripe for uh, research is creating new visualizations and new worlds. In other words, getting in the head of geniuses, stealing their mental models, replicating it in VR, and then using that to learn. So, you know, wouldn't it have been great to have Einstein cornered for a year and try to replicate what he visualizes when he's thinking about math and physics and then trying to use that to teach. And so that might be another bullet point for you, Alicia, uh, why we might use VR and that's to make the abstract more real. Cause that's something that, you know, can certainly be done in 2D, but I think if we can immerse ourselves in a mental model and see what geniuses see, that, that could be interesting. It may, it I may- I love that, I'm adding it. <laughs> Awesome. I will give you credit. Thank you. I appreciate that. You don't have to. You can take credit. I don't care. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Uh, so, like I mentioned, it's kind of natural to start out imitating reality. But <laughs> as you can see, this kid here, you know, how many of us can do that? Okay, certainly the students and, and younger people. And I imagine Alicia can do this. But not me. I don't want to be crouched down. So this, this, this photo here there's a you know a young person he's uh looking at a car or some some piece of equipment but he's had to get up under it and you know crouch down and you know because it's, it's a realistic scenario and i think there's a little screenshot to the right where you can kind of see that hey it doesn't really look that great to begin with but there's this fully animated avatar you know that represents people so the developers spend a lot of time on the avatar system and maybe a little less time on the, the equipment. So what's, you know, what's more important when you're, when you're doing anything like from a grant or, you know, doing a commercial product, you have, you have a limited budget. So you want to spend your money on the things that matter. And sometimes the realistic stuff doesn't matter as much as you think. Like it's not important to have a full body avatar in a lot of cases, just not important. It's more important to have a, a better representation of the vehicle, but also allow it to manipulate, be able to lift it up in the air, be able to look at all the parts, 360 rotate, go beyond reality. So realism has its place, but we can do better. Um, for example, uh, UX, a lot of people start out doing physical um, interactions, pushing the, the physical button or, um, you know, doing the levers and things. Sometimes that's appropriate, especially if you're operating equipment. But one of the uh, safety training um, VR experiences made by a competitor, you had to go, if you wanted to go to the next room, you had to walk over. This was on an HTC Vive room scale. You had to walk over, hit a button on a pole. Well, I was visiting a client and they had this app and they were having to reach way back, they had a cable attached to them and they're gonna reach way back and hit that pole and it was like just outside their space and um, it just, it made no sense. And you know, you don't, why do you have to walk up, you know, why do you have to walk five feet and push a button on the pole? So they were trying to make it real and cool, but it didn't really serve the purpose well and it created problems. And we have the same thing on, our, if you can see my background, there's a um, presentation screen. So a lot of what we do is we mix, uh, current curriculum with 3D curriculum, our virtual curriculum. And we have a, a workbench where you have a next and slide physical buttons. And those are those are okay, but there's some things we could do. We could have a little sl touch slider area where we could, you know, touch and move through. There's, you know, we could have stuff pop up. And there might be, what I'm saying is there's a lot easier things that, not, not easier, but there's a lot more, there's probably better, more intuitive things we could do than just physical stuff. So, this is my way of, uh, and I'll continue this theme, is just I want you guys to think um, deeper because it's a lot like writing. Um, I learned as a storyteller that your first idea is usually cliche because that's how our brains work. And that's, you know, it's like, oh, I'll do this thing. But it's usually a, a cliche, especially if you're trying to be original and tell an original story or you're trying to be uh, effective in a VR application or, a, you know, other immersive learning medium. 
usually uh, you need to think past that initial idea and, and question it and poke holes on it and think to a second. And sometimes I find the third level of, of digging down and drilling and, and trying new ideas is the one that really works. So one of the superpowers you can have is vulner invulnerability. Um, hey, we've been playing video games for a long time. So, so we know this, there's a, you know, there's virtual death. Uh, sometimes that's applicable. Sometimes it's, it's not. So, uh, let's think about safety training. If you, if you die from a fall, let's say you fall, we've got this one scene where you fall out of a, a, a boom lift, which is a, a platform that can go way up in the air. Uh, that's one of the, uh, common ways you can get injured or die. Um, so you're going to remember it if you actually fall out of a boom lift in VR and die, right? So you're, you're, the initial thought is, hey, let's 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 kill them if they fall out of the boom lift. Well, there's a few problems with that. One is motion sickness. Hey, you're falling and the world's turning and you know blah. So that's not cool. You could steady the camera as they fall and die. You could let them see their body hit the ground. Um, but taking it deeper. You know, you, you got to realize, okay, there's there's construction workers that are going to be taking this um, this this training, and you know, there's there's a thing, there's such a thing as uh, PTSD or trauma or triggering. They they may know someone that died from such an accident, or you know, there may be, or maybe it's a little bit too close to home or personal for them. So don't you know, don't do that. What we do is we we when there's an accident, we pull the uh, camera back to the point of view. So basically the user is suspended in there and they get to watch a crash dummy go through the, um, through the fall. And so that's our way of trying to find a good compromise of, hey, this is very serious, but we don't want to traumatize you or make you motion sick. Um, some of these slides I might go through a little quick because I'm trying to be mindful of, of time, Alicia. Um, but perspective is important, uh, you know, like God's eye view, you got to think of what you're trying to do. If it's a airport rescue responder uh, scenario, they might need to see the entire airport. If they're the person managing it, they might have, have, have the God's eye view or if there's a battle scene or, or some other thing, there's sometimes the ant or microscopic view can make sense if they need to see things that are occurring um, at an atomic level or small level. Um, so, my overall message here is imagine all the different ways you can see things beyond the normal human view. Um, for example, in, in our sales app, we put, we put a teleport spot on top of the fin of a giant, you know, one of the biggest commercial air, airplanes in the world um, and let people stand up there. Well, that's not realistic, but it, it's fun. And it's interesting that people have that view of the plane and just realize how big it is. Um, X-ray vision, that's, this might be a little bit obvious, but just imagine in a learning situation, um, you know, if you're teaching people how to use a pump station on a fire truck, it's very complicated. It's the most important job out there. But if you give them X-ray vision as part of their education, they can see the flow of chemicals or the liquid, whatever it is. They can see the rate. They can see the direct result of you know, pressure and knobs and switches and, you know, that they're turning and they can get really great feedback. And of course, as you all know, um, you know, when you, when you understand what's behind what you're being taught, that's, that's just another large step in, in learning it. Uh, one of the things I've learned, um, the fun thing about doing training and education, you learn a lot about different things that you never would. And I learned that in a maintenance hole, um, in a sewer system, there are different levels of depth that gases can be um, sitting and can be deadly. So you want to train someone to put a gas sensor at different levels to um, measure different levels of, of the gas. You don't just drop it to the bottom and see it's okay because the, the, the worst one can be right in the middle and that can kill you. And of course, you know, more obvious x-ray vision is, is surgery. And we've probably seen some of those where you're doing heart surgery or intubation or something like that. It's very important to see what's going on. Um, I'm going to go through this one a little quickly, but it's uh, this kind of goes back to the language demo we just saw where you've got, <laughs> I, I'm being a little overly clever here, but it's like AR and VR, you know, informational pop-ups. Um, 
anything that's uh, invisible could be made visible like wind and chemicals or forces. One of the ways we're using it with equipment where like a gas and um, a pipe fusion machine, uh, pressure is very important when you're applying clamps or turning uh, nozzles or, or uh, handles. And so since we don't have full haptics, uh, one of the ways we help is by the visuals of showing how tight it is and it's trying to give them at least a um, informational uh, feedback for that. Um, and related to that is uh, the haptics and the motion. Um, here is uh, Facebook's new wrist um, muscle sensing, nerve sensing um, contraption for lack of better words. And it allows you to type in, in a virtual world or to grab things. And if you were to think, you know, if you were to take my advice and think deeper um, and start analyzing typing itself, you know, the reason that we type the way we do is because of our physical limitations, gravity, orientation, things like that. Maybe there's a better way to type in VR. Maybe it's faster because, you know, we're not limited so much to the physical world. So we can go beyond reality. Maybe we can learn to type better or more efficiently. Um, Maybe sign language can be used to, to, to uh, execute um, actions. You know, there's just, there's a lot of possibilities there. Um, related to that, uh, <laughs> we did a game a while back. And it was called uh, Hop Along the Badlands. And I'm gonna just skip to the middle really quick. <laughs> If you search for Hop Along in the Badlands on, in, on YouTube, you can see a lot of videos. But the thing I want to point out is we, you ride a stick horse and you use that for your motion. So like you could hop up and down, of course you'd be exhausted, but you can move the horse as if you were hopping up and down and then you can shoot with your gun. And wherever you aim the horse, that's where you go. And the more that you move the horse, the faster you go. So there's a lot of unique look motion things I think that are possible. And I haven't seen that done too much. But we've also done, um, you know, it's pure walking motion for moving around environments. And that's, it's a lot of fun and it's very intuitive. Um, time travel, time travel, looking at my time. Oh, I'm, I'm good on time. Time travel uh, is another superpower. In the video game industry, we used a thing called uh, replay and we had a thing called ghost mode. So I did a game where we had a, uh, Formula One racing, and you could race against yourself. So once you've done a race, a uh, ghost car would appear, and then you could uh, race against yourself and try to better yourself. So you take that same concept to learning and education and training. You know, it, this is probably more applicable to physical types of things, but it could be applied to other types of learning. But imagine, you know, you're you know, we're, we're really trying to better ourselves. You know, they say you shouldn't, shouldn't try to compare yourself to somebody else. You're really just trying to better yourself. So what better way than to, to play against yourself in, or in, when you're learning? Um, and then any kind of fast forward review, replays, that's, these are all things I'm uh, putting in time travel. Um, Along those lines, and this is the approach we've taken. So this is one of our training rooms. Uh, uh, we call this the infinity room. If you notice in the picture on the slide, there's terrain and trees and clouds. Well, you don't really need that to be immersed. And I think there's some studies. I wish I'd looked them up before the talk, but I think there's at least one study that, that, that talks about not needing to be that immersed to be immersed. I mean, you go in, if you go in and operate a machine in an affinity room, you're focused on that machine. You feel like you're there. Um, you, it, your brain is still fully tricked and still fully immersed in an education. So at least from, you know, uh, uh, Randall was holding up the uh, quest two earlier. Those are, those are wonderful devices and all of us that have used it just, just love it. But it's still very limited when it comes to 
the very high end graphics uh, driven PC VR systems. So you need to be careful about frame rate and development and rendering. So it's even more important for the mobile devices to focus on only what's important. Uh, this is just a little quick thing. I saw this one time and thought it was cool and I wanted to mention it. it's a VR in AR. I saw a remote, remote worker had his phone up on some equipment and this product that was showcased and he could see the expert in a different location. The expert was in VR in his AR. And so the expert back at the home base had a VR model of the equipment and that allowed the expert to actually hands-on show the remote worker where things were and how to do stuff. So it went beyond just, hey, you know, telling them do this, do that. They could show them. Um, not always practical, but depending on the situation, it might be uh, a cool thing to do. So it's, I thought it was very clever and creative. Uh, <laughs> I've got a very odd fascination with Clippy. I don't know, some of you are probably old enough to remember the old Microsoft Word helper. Super annoying, everybody hated him. Uh, he was this little AI assistant that would say, hey, I, I see you're trying to write a resume. Let me make some suggestions, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, but the essence of Clippy is super helpful in VR and, and we don't even do it enough in our products, but this context sensitive help with, uh, you know, cause I think, you know, people have various levels of expertise going in, but if you can, you know, since we're tracking uh, what they're doing and their motion and stuff, we know when they're moving or not moving or whether they're engaged or not engaged. And that's a really good opportunity to, to provide um, some assistance. So not a huge enlightening thing. I just wanted to bring up Clippy. Oh, and I'm writing a science fiction book where Clippy's in it. So I'm, I'm doubly excited about that. Um, all right, here's the good stuff. Mental models. When... There was a study done where um, the researcher went and researched, you know, how people visualized the calendar year. And it was all over the map. There were a few people, you know, there were a few things that, that were common of how vis people visualize time in the year. Sometimes it was in a clock, clock-like um, visualization. Uh, where certain months were on the month bottom and certain months on the top, but sometimes people had them in different places. And I thought, I thought about my own mental model for the seasons, and I think it was a little outside the, um, the realm. I, I tend to think of the, me standing in the middle of a year or a timeline where, for some reason, September's up here and spring is down here and Christmas is here and summer's over here, and it's, you know, it's just, it's just whatever I, you know, as a kid, when I first learned about the calendar, that's what I came up with. And so studying mental models and reading about it, a lot of uh, geniuses, for lack of a better word, like uh, the physicist Feynman, had very unique mental models and ways of visualizing and understanding physics and mathematics. And their unique perspective, you know, some, somebody like Feynman was known as a troubleshooter because he could he could jump in and, and help other physicists, mathematicians, you know, figure out difficult problems because he had a unique perspective. Um, so I don't know even where to begin on something like that, but if we could capture mental models that are very effective, it might be, it might be that immersion in mental models would help people learn these ways of thinking. A really good area, I think, again, with abstraction is, is mathematics, you know, a lot of struggle with imaginary numbers. Um, first of all, it's got a terrible name. They're not really imaginary. So immediately your brain is thrown, but trying to understand, you know, a, a number that doesn't really fit our world. It's like other world, you know, there are very good examples of, of the use of imaginary numbers. Like they're used in quaternions. And in game development or VR development, quaternions are very important for rotating objects because they do a very effective job. If you try to, if you try to rotate an object in 3D space using the old uh, angle method, you'll get what's called gimbal lock, which basically boils down to unexpected results under with certain rotations. 
But if you want to fully understand quaternions, you've got to fully understand, or at least partially understand imaginary numbers. I think this could be taught in an immersive learning situation where you've got graphs and things you can interact with and pull, you can use colors, sound, um, physics to, to visualize this. And, and, and one example is the, the, the um, is pi and understanding, you know, the circumfer how that, how that mathematically equates to the diameter of a circle and the you know, the ratio of the circumference, you know, why is pi and a seemingly probably infinite number? You know, we don't know the end of it. But you could, you could explain that by showing, you know, pi, you could show the circle in a crude graphic step, you know, 3.14 blah, you could show it at a certain, and then show, and show how, the circle gets more and more um, perfect the more you increase the the uh, digits or the um, the uh, decimal part of the uh, of the number and you know so there's a lot of and you could do some of those visualizations in 2D no question I think I think as far as just even regular computers we've we've got so much work to do to make it make education more effective but uh, I do have this intuitive feeling not research back that some of these abstractions could be taught better if you're immersed. So I think it's a really, really interesting area. Um, so the future, uh, you know, I kind of been talking about that as we go along. We're, we're all pioneers. We're on the very edge. There's, I often tell potential clients and, and other, anybody that'll listen that, um, at some point in the future, you know, it could be three years, could be 10 years. We'll look back and say, how did we learn without, immersive learning because I feel like the impact of it is just so extreme, um, especially in the future when hardware adapts a little better and we're not um, burdened with today's technology. Um, and, you know, there's really a, no definitive line between AR and VR with, with a particular headset. Uh, you know, I think it'll just be more, more natural to wear and easier for a lot of people to just jump in and out. In the meantime, you know, we need to start, we need to continue to do the research and figuring these things out. And so there's no doubt in my mind, I've, I've drank the, the VR Kool-Aid, um, that immersive learning is the future. Uh, so thank you. Um, I hope that was good timing on my part. Hey, wow, pretty close. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm Mike Christian. There's some links. You're welcome to, to email me with questions or ideas or, or what have you. Um, there's my LinkedIn and then company Facebook and company LinkedIn if you want to follow what we're doing. Uh, so that's it for the presentation part, Alicia. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Oh, wow. I like this. Oh, this is how we talk now. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, we have 10 minutes for questions. Um, if anyone has questions for, for Mike. And also, I will say I got to uh, play the hop along game at, at, at the uh, From the Future um, visit that we had last year. Or, yeah. gosh, I guess it's been two years. Time flies when you're in a pandemic. It really does. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it, it was so awesome. Like, it, just the fact that you can come up with whole new ways to um, create experiences to control something just so great. I and I love the way that you think outside of the box for that. And it looks like uh, Dr. Chilia has a question. Thank you so much for your for your presentation. It was really um, so well, you know, divided up into these different opportunities. And I was thinking, uh, you know, having taught English in the past and thought about how to match up, you know, different activities with different grammar points, all these ideas were coming to mind of how we could, you know, from what you've got to actual language teaching, um, I know nothing about the technology aspect or how to make it available to people or any of that, but the fact that it could be made available, I think would be very exciting. I was wondering if there were studies done, um, and this may be also a question for Alicia, which is like, you, we talked about, you know, the, the positive effects of it. Um, uh, were, were there also things that had to do with like boredom or repetitive, if you repeat a particular, um, one of those you know, possibility, possible interactions. Do people get bored more easily? Because grammar can be very repetitive and you want people to learn through pattern. But I wonder, you know, how much we'll have to vary to keep people's interest to be using different types of 
events or things. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think when you contrast it against uh, more traditional ways of learning language, it's already uh, much more engaging. But I do think the repetitive question is is a great one, and I believe that you know what Alicia and Michael are working on, and what Monley has done, um, just takes it to a whole new level when you're immersing in a foreign language. Um, as far as, you know, just going and interacting or going to a coffee shop or a bus ride, you know, whatever context. And if you're traveling, a lot of those things are, th you know, things you would do for travel if you want to learn a, a travel aspect of the language. Uh, but one of the things I've, I've been exploring, and I don't know how exactly it would apply um, to language learning, but uh, with mathematics, we're doing some autism uh, spectrum skills building. And the traditional uh, ABA therapy for, for uh, people on the spectrum is flashcards. And they sit there, um, you know, with the therapists and they're, you know, they, they, get, they get bored very quickly. So we're replicating that experience in VR, but we're making it full 3D objects. And, you know, they can grab stuff, and you can interact stuff, and there's responses and there's the reward part of the um, ABA it's usually some fun activity, but we give them uh, a, a playground where they can uh, uh, drive cars and climb stuff and put on a, a costume and, and share the experience with other, other people, other friends. Um, but one of the things that I've worked on that might not make it in is in the math level where I'm just teaching basic numbers. I try to use everything I can think of, which is audio. I give like one, two, three, four. I give them different different um, notes, different sounds, give them different colors, different weight. If they pick up the number nine and throw it, it goes a lot further than the number one. Um, uh, there's a particle effect that's more on the number nine than the number one. So I try to differentiate. So at least at, um, that level of learner, you know, trying to engage all the senses. But I think maybe that, that might be an interesting thing to try just with, learning in general and language learning, you know, how can we engage all the, you know, all the senses that are available to us in VR and how can we augment information? Like, is it useful to see the a graph of the history of the language, the root words and where they come from pop up in context, you know, is that, does that help? Is there, is there uh, memory um, tricks that we could, apply to augment to help people remember foreign language like if they're if their primary language is english and they're learning spanish is there associations that that we can make or little so you know like a, a clever developer could create um cards or or uh, related items to help them memorize faster there might be traditional techniques that already exist for that sort of thing that we could then apply to vr so th there's some of my ideas If I could jump in, you know, I, I'm, this is more of a comment than a question, but I couldn't, <clears throat> I couldn't uh, agree more with your point about uh, do, do we always need to have reality when it comes to virtual reality uh, or virtual worlds for that matter? You know, the number of places I've seen in virtual worlds where, where a, a university or a business has, has recreated their university or their business uh, in this virtual space. It's like, why, you know, you, you, you already have it, you know, go, go beyond, you know, stretch things, you know, how can you make use of these settings in a way that you can't in the, in the real world? Uh, it's a, it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine. Yeah, mine too. I'm totally with you. And if you think about conferences, because that became a big issue this last year in person conferences versus virtual conferences, um, you know, you one quickly realized all the disadvantages of a real conference, you know, the fatigue of walking around, the yeah. having to talk to people that you don't want to talk to right. and not being able to talk to the people that you want to talk to. And just, you know, everything that goes with it, the travel and the cost. Yeah. You don't want to recreate that. <laughs> no. Or <laughs> throw out all the bad stuff and yeah. try to see what what can I do to make all the things that are, are missing or challenging better. Yeah. Yeah, Being yeah. six foot six and having to fly in an airplane to a conference, <laughs> oh, oh, wow. not not a good thing. Uh, Dr. T uh, Tusi, uh, Dr. Hiromi has uh, had his hand up, so uh, 
I know that you must have something to say. <laughs> well, thanks. Well, first, I want to thank Mike. I love your presentation. I also thank teach you. a course on game design. And I want to invite you later to be a guest speaker when next spring when I teach you. Oh, yeah, I'd love to do that. So the comment about fidelity and reality is interesting that Randall mentioned. I just wanted to comment on that, too. So I, I worked on this one game that we're teaching Navy um, officers as well as uh, just the soldiers how to put fires out on Navy ships. And we found that the more exact that we want to try to make the ship, the more they pick at problems. So <laughs> we have this whole fidelity kind of curve that says you only want to make the things that are essential for learning high fidelity. But everyone who wants high fidelity because it's cool. But we try to emphasize the fact that you want to make other things cartoon-like or abstract because then people don't focus on you know, that latch isn't correct, or that door or that control panel is not in the right place. But the question I had for you, Mike, is, you know, when I teach the game class, mm -hmm. I teach people to design a game, I have them design it, then I have them create um, a board game version or a desktop prototype version, because I find that I haven't found an application that's relatively easy for them to develop a game, an electronic game. Do you know of any relatively easy applications out there where people can create a prototype without too much programming background? I, I'm pretty sure there's some fairly good ones that are not, um, you know, not immersive. Uh, are you speaking just in general or in a, in a VR setting? Well, I guess in a VR setting, since we're talking about VR today. But in any kind of situation, I, besides the, you know, the, the, the game show games, I mean, those, yeah, those are there's, there's two approaches that I've taken. And one is to use um, something like Tilt Brush or the Microsoft. And I, I don't use them regularly. So I'm, I'm forgetting what the Microsoft one's called. Some of them has some pretty good uh, layout and, you know, blocking out scenes and that sort of thing. But it's and, and visualization, but there's not any, you know, uh, there's very little interaction and stuff like that. So what I find out is just um, going ahead and using Unity to to block out in a very rough gray box slash blue box manner for um, for uh, designing the game and make sure that the actual you know uh, movement and and physical locations of things and the size of things and you know any any tricky new gameplay elements that you're trying you know if you can do them without a lot of art involvement, you know, give those a try. Um, and so that's typically what we do, but, you know, we're, we're uh, a lot of us are programmers and artists used to, to jumping in, but I do know that at least with Unreal Engine's uh, blueprints and then uh, Unity's new version of that, forgot its name again, you know, where it's diagram based can really help some people that, that aren't familiar with programming. Cause I, I know one of our artists can do quite a bit using Unreal Engine's uh, blueprint system. Thank you. I agree with that. And I also added um, Game Maker because I, I know a small game developer who has made games and sold them using Game Maker. So, um, and then Randall put in the chat RPG Maker also. Um, and, and it's time for us to move on to the next speaker, but I just wanted to kind of, uh, first of all, thank Mike again. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. Um, and then also add, um, based on Dr. Chilia's first question to you. Um, I think that that's pretty telling on how important it is for us to be thinking about longitudinal research. Like we do so much really quick instance based research, like my study, 15 minutes and Elite Dangerous, but we know very little about sustained impact of using VR, especially for education. Um, so, and I, I feel like uh, Dr. Harumi is the one most positioned to tell tell me where I'm wrong in that <laughs> and give us direction on how to get more information about that. But uh, I still think we need a lot more longitudinal studies. Largely that comes from not having money to do studies and keep track of participants. But maybe once we have all of these great minds here together today working on this idea, we can figure out ways to uh, make sustained research that gives us these outcomes. And thanks again, Mike. You're welcome. Thank you for the, the opportunity. Enjoyed it.